350 years of military history in 15 minutes. I, I've got to get cracking. Um, I do have to talk about the French rather a lot, though, General. Um, <laughs> uh, well, we've been here before. Uh, welcome back to the Army's Year Zero, 1660, the restoration of the monarchy after the turbulent years of the Civil War and military government. At the Land Warfare Conference, the talk is of returning to contingency after 20 years of operations. And the pressing slide uh, for the head of the army, General George Monk, a big man, still, re <laughs> still recovering from his famous winter march from Coldstream earlier in the year, which triggered the return of the king from exile, is to reduce regular manpower and make greater use of the reserves. There are 30,000 regulars of Cromwell's new model army still on the strength. What's to be done with them? In fact, King Charles' strategic guidance is clear. It's to resume the default setting of British defence policy, as expressed a century before by the first sea lord, Sir Walter Raleigh. In other words, British military strategy is once again maritime. Land power has limited utility. General Monk has been told to pay off the 30,000 troops, except for some artillerists, to man the forts covering the main naval anchorages, and a few more for His Majesty's guards. Two, perhaps 3,000. They'll always be the militia. We must, face, we must face facts, gentlemen. Deep in the British psyche is the belief that we don't need soldiers. Not regular soldiers, at any rate. It's the Royal Navy, the wooden walls, which has always kept out the foreign rabble, and as the guardian of the nation's prosperity. But almost at once, the numbers have to be revised upwards, for the security service discovers a plot against the king and suggests that his majesty's guards ought to be increased. And then the king makes a fortuitous marriage to a Portuguese princess whose diary includes the port of Tangiers, for which we will have to raise a garrison of about 5,000. Stationing troops overseas is expensive, though, and after a while, Parliament will refuse to keep funding them. And what luck that they'll be brought back home in 1685, just in time to see off a challenge to the new king, the Catholic James II, by one of Charles's bastards, the Duke of Monmouth. For when Monmouth and his men land in Dorset, James will call out the militia, who will be mightily slow in mobilising and ineffective when they do. And it will be his Tangiers regulars rushed to the West Country who put down the insurrection. After Sedgemoor, the last battle on English soil, James concludes that he'll have to build up the strength of the standing army against such a threat in future, which he'll do by secretly flexing money voted by Parliament for the training of the militia to raise new reg regular regiments instead. Ultimately, it will do him no good, however, for three years later, the men in grey suits will have had enough of his arbitrary ways and invite his son-in-law, the staunchly Protestant William of Orange, to come and take the throne instead. 30,000 seasoned Dutch troops will land in Devon. The Royal Navy, incidentally, will fail to intercept them, just as they'd failed to intercept the Duke of Monmouth's ships. And James's army will rush west to Salisbury Plain, always a good place for a battle, or at least pretend battle, for by, for by the time William's army reaches Warminster, James's senior officers, including John Churchill, the future Duke of Marlborough, will have changed sides, and the king will flee the country, the last time the British army will do regime change at home. <laughs> but what interest could William and Mary, his wife and co-monarch, have in the British throne as well as the Netherlands? The answer simply is that William and his Dutch Republic have been fighting the French for so long that they are running out of resources, and we have money, manpower, and arms. And within 15 years, the British Army will become a vast continental force to be reckoned with, perhaps some 200,000 men in red coats winning famous battles. Blenheim, Ramillies, Oudenard, Malplaquet. But when we've seen off the existential threat to Protestant Europe from Louis XIV's France, Parliament will want its peace dividend. The draft SDSR of 1715 sees a regular army of just 12,000 men, and it's only the shock of a Jacobite rising that year, i.e. by supporters of the deposed King James 
and backed by France, on the death of Queen Anne and the accession of the Hanoverian George that will make a larger number of troops seem more prudent. But with King George, who is also King of Hanover, will come King George's Hanoverian Wars, sometimes against other Germans, more usually against the French. We are drawn into our allies' battles. So by the second quarter of the 18th century, the idea that land forces are a contingency, an insurance policy, with the premium to be kept as small as possible, has developed instead into three specific commitments, three pillars of commitment, if you like, to maintaining the king's peace, to defeating the king's enemies, and to winning the king's empire. And these pillars will remain standing, variously modified and in various degrees of repair, until, well, only recently, the time predicted by commentators only two decades ago as the end of, as the end of history. For nearly three centuries, military planners have no need of conferences. The commitments are absolutely clear as also, in the main, are the requirements. The only debate is resource allocation. Now, if all this sounds a bit Ladybird Book of Military History, let me direct you to a much fuller analysis. Now, this is, <laughs> <coughs> this is, this, this is outrageous. Um, so, um, or as my American publishers want, to, want the cover for publication later this year. They were terribly pleased with that picture. They thought it a fine artistic representation of the special relationship, except, of course, that it's actually a picture of Sir John Burgoyne surrendering to General Horatio Gates after the Battle of Saratoga. But it lets me make a point about strategic shocks and the dubious reassessments that can follow, distorting budgets and therefore options. Saratoga is one of the decisive battles of history. It's actually a bit of a backwoods scrap, but the defeat of a British force signals to the French, who that year don't happen to be at war with us, to throw in with the American colonists. They send their fleet across the Atlantic, where they should by rights be seen off by the Royal Navy, but the Royal Navy isn't there. London, directing operations with a long screwdriver, has sent His Majesty's ships to the Caribbean to seize French sugar islands. We lose control of the American seaboard, are therefore unable to move troops quickly, and the rest is history. In the SDSR that follows the loss of the colonies, it's clear to London that loss of sea control was fundamental. Their answer is not, therefore, to make a more capable army, but to build more ships. Indeed, when war with revolutionary France comes a dozen years later, two-thirds of total government spending is being spent on the Royal Navy. The army, meanwhile, is starved of manpower, equipment, ideas, and competent commanders. And it isn't until 1810 that we begin to make any impact on the war with the campaign in the peninsula. Yes, the Navy means we won't be invaded, and capturing French colonies generates the gold that will subsidize our continental allies. But without a capable army, we can't influence the war on land being fought by our allies, let alone bring it to a conclusion by capturing Paris. The nation learns its lesson. So what does the SDSR of 1816 conclude? Well, that two of the pillars can be cut down considerably. Once again, there'll be no requirement for large-scale war fighting. In future, the Congress system initiated at Vienna will resolve all matters diplomatically. As for internal security, the monarchy looks pretty safe, Ireland is peaceful, and soon there will be police forces to take over the distasteful job of maintaining public order. There is most certainly an imperial requirement and a growing one, but this is an essentially small-scale requirement, no need of divisions and brigades, only the regimental virtues. So even this pillar can be reduced. There will be a wake-up call in the Crimean War, but we'll muddle through on sheer guts. And the Crimean War is, after all, an aberration of political policy. It shouldn't have happened, so policymakers will make sure the same mistake doesn't happen again. Mm. And yes, Ireland will become restless as the 19th century goes on, and we'll need to strengthen the garrisons there. And the threat of invasion by France in the 1860s, extraordinary as that seems today, will be met by the creation of what in time will become the TA, a growing body of enthusiastic volunteers who will increasingly capture public imagination 
and parliaments for their ch a cheap option compared with increasing the strength of the regular army and building forts. And they will in uh, exert an increasing influence on military policy. So, the army will concentrate its doctrine and equipment on imperial policing, while the navy will be kept at the cutting edge of technology, no matter what the cost. Here's a photograph of HMS Hood in 1893, just after she is commissioned. Not, of course, the famous battle cruiser sunk by Bismarck, but her predecessor, the pre-Dreadnought class battleship. She's powered by triple expansion steam engines. She can make 18 knots, the speed of a cavalry regiment in a fast canter. Her hull carries a belt of 18-inch compound armor. She has twin 13.5-inch guns served hydraulically in a rotating armor-plated gun turret with a range of 12,000 yards, laid with the aid of optical rangefinders. She is lit electrically, and just a few years after this photograph, she'll be fitted with wireless. And yet, in 1889, the year in which her keel is laid, the army will go on campaign against the Zulu one last time in red coats. Quite a thought. Well, it can only be time before the army meets with another strategic shock, and it comes in 1889. 1899, when some 12,000 armed Dutch settlers managed to run rings around a much greater force of professionals in South Africa for more than a year, inflicting some serious defeats in conventional field battles, and subdued only after a massive reinforcement and change of leadership. In September 1900, with the Boer capitals captured, the Commander-in-Chief Lord Roberts will declare mission accomplished, and go home, handing over to his chief of staff, Kitchener. But then will follow the insurgency and another bitter 18 months of operations, sucking in a quarter of a million British and Imperial troops. Sound familiar? We all know, I think, what happens in the aftermath of the Boer War. Frenetic reform from top to bottom. A general staff is created. The infantry learns to shoot accurately at 15 rounds a minute. The artillery is re-equipped with quick-firing guns. The cavalry takes up the rifle as well as the sword and lance. And the Royal Flying Corps is formed within three years of Blerio just making it, making it across the channel. So that in 1914, the British Expeditionary Force will be, to quote the official historian, incomparably the best trained, best organized, and best equipped British army that ever went forth to war. But in fact, the so-called Haldane reforms failed in the end to get to grips with the principal criticism of the South Africa Committee of Inquiry, i.e., quote, the lack of a mechanism for expanding the number of troops available in both the short and medium terms. And Haldane never managed to echelon the TA properly, so that as a result in 1914, we had to improvise a mass army, Kitchener's new army, with very bloody consequences. And I wonder if expanding the number of troops available in both the short and medium terms ought not to be one of our contingency plans very soon. Now, I fear that the centenary of the Great War may become one big emote on the mud and trenches of the Western Front. Certainly, there are going to be skip loads of books published. Be careful what you read. <laughs> I'm pushing it, I know. Um, I hope people will be reminded that the war was fought worldwide and also that there was a significant time of fighting before the trenches and after. The CGS said that the French army in Mali has set the standard for Elan. I heard the other day that some ministers believe that our army, after so many years fixed in Iraq and Afghanistan, lacks this Elan, may lack this Elan. Who am I to comment? But it's worth remembering that the British Army had been fixed in the trenches for nearly four years when they rose out of them magnificently in August 1918 to begin that brilliant all-arms manoeuvre campaign of the Hundred Days, finally to defeat the German Army. They may have something to teach us. But as we go into our contingency-based future, what some call dormancy, it's worth reflecting on this painting by John Singer Sargent called Some Generals of the First World War, or more irreverently, Still Life with Boots. It, hang <laughs> it hangs in the National Portrait Gallery. Go, go and see it. These aren't one, two, or even three-star generals. They're four and five stars. In 1918, we had five discrete armies in France and two in the Middle East. And then after the war, it all went virtually overnight. 
the three pillars were seriously shaken. There remained an imperial policing requirement, larger than ever, but still essentially a small-scale one. Soon, the internal security pillar, Ireland, would seem to be gone with the Treaty of 1922, and continental war was so remote as to be formally deemed impossible for ten years, the so-called ten-year rule. How did we manage in the next 20 years to hold on to the expertise represented in that painting? Again, it's worthy of serious study. For although 1940 was a disastrous start for the army, by October 1942, we'd got our act back together. Perhaps not having had to prepare for too particular a commitment in the interwar years, the army hadn't committed itself to too particularized equipment or doctrine, to excessive specificity specificity, wasting money and time on things made obsolescent overnight by events. There are advantages in contingency-based planning. It just takes a lot more intellectual engagement. The three pillars weren't done within 1945, of course. The Cold War wasn't a contingency but an absolute commitment, which meant we had to have conscription in peacetime. And, of course, we had the rundown of the empire to manage, needing even more troops than we needed to win it. While from 1969, internal security once again reared its head with the start of yet another IRA campaign. Even just 25 years ago, all three pillars were still looking fairly solid. Today, however, for the first time in the Army's history, there isn't a pillar left standing. No colonial commitment to speak of, no internal security threat requiring a military response, no demonstrable external threat. All that's left of the pillars is these three familiar circular impressions, and it's within these shallow imprints that the army will have to apply its greatest imagination, as well as making sure that the sands of time don't obscure the imprints altogether in the sight of politicians. Well, I haven't the faintest idea if any of this has been helpful, except to show that we've been here before. The best advice surely remains as it was when we were facing our greatest task, except...